News First Newsline. Hello there, very good evening and welcome to a brand new edition of Newsline. We're coming to you live and direct from our News First studios here in Colombo. Of course, uh, this is the first show after the Singhala and Tamil New Year dawned just this afternoon. So let me take this opportunity to wish all our viewers out there a happy and prosperous Singhala and Tamil New Year. And I also take this opportunity to welcome our guest on the show today, Attorney at Law, Dr. Jagath Gunavardhana. He's an environmental activist course always on the forefront of defending Sri Lanka's nature against all forces both local and foreign thank you very much doctor for joining us on our show this evening okay. uh, so dr. Jagat Gunavardhana although we're celebrating the dawn of the Singhala and Tamil New Year and uh, with many of Sri Lanka's traditions being intertwined with the nature here in Sri Lanka uh, there are many issues that Sri Lanka faced as far as protecting the environment goes that happened last year that we're carrying forward into this year. Uh, chief among them is uh, the issue surrounding uh, other forests. Uh, it was a circular that was issued uh, under the government of President Gotabe Rajapaksa, granting powers to uh, divisional secretaries to release areas that have been designated as other forests uh, for agricultural and various other purposes. This uh, gave rise to much controversy and, of course, environmental activists like attorney at law Dr. Jagatuna Vardhana uh, and, uh, well, of course, his colleagues took these matters to court. Uh, doctor, this issue has not come to a final conclusion. There is an interim order that has been issued, uh, uh, you know, suspending the operation of this circular and affording these other forests the protection that they were uh, afforded under the previous regulations that were drafted. What's happening there, sir? The court has suspended the, regular, the circulars, mm -hmm. so it's in a way a positive step because this circular would have permitted the distribution of other state forests for different purposes other than for forest purposes. We all know that we are in a situation where we don't have even the minimum forest cover that is necessary. Mm -hmm. So the need of the hour is to protect forests mm -hmm. as far as possible and not to distribute land from forest. If we need any land for development activities, we may have to find land from the other areas that had been once forests and now denuded of their forest cover or land that has been uh, part of plantations and hmm. had been now disused or any other disused land. So rather than finding land for different purposes, there is a tendency in part of some of these state and non-state bodies to go for forest land for their development activities. This tendency has to stop. And we are in a situation that we cannot no longer afford to give forest land for these different projects, but we have to have more intensive type of development projects where we make maximum use of the area of land that has been given for a particular activity. Let's take for agriculture. For the past 100 years or so, the agriculture had been what we call intensive agriculture where we had tried to produce as much from a given area of land mm. and not to sacrifice more land for more productivity right. because that is a age-old concept that has gone disused now. Mm. But still we are sticking to some of these old disused or redundant policies that had been pursued by the colonial administrations. But we have to think anew. We have to think of measures where land is used minimally for different purposes mm. and not to use any land from the forests anymore. So that's our position. The only way we can use or sacrifice forests is if there is a dire need to get part of it for something of national importance. But for various other projects, I think we have to go for other options now. Uh, Dr. Jagat Gunavardhana, uh, along, well, this is almost uh, half won the battle at least because there is an interim order suspending this circular uh, and of course usually the tendency is these interim orders will be made permanent orders uh, a few months or maybe even a few years in. Uh, however, there is a new controversy of course that has come about uh, with regard to this time around uh, not the environment but a part of the environment, wildlife here in Sri Lanka, uh, specifically monkeys. Uh, there were reports uh, that uh, plans are afoot to export 100,000 monkeys uh, to China. Uh, well, this step, uh, according to several officials, of course, 
uh, who have sometimes been quoted, sometimes being named as anonymous sources, uh, is because the monkey population in Sri Lanka is so massive uh, and as, of course, a solution to this issue that we're facing, uh, a booming monkey population is to export 100,000 monkeys to China. Uh, several wildlife organizations have raised concerns with these plans. Of course, this plan still hasn't received cabinet approval. What's your take on this, Doctor? I can look at it from three different angles. Hmm. And all three different angles converge onto a common point of view. The first is the species. This is the talk monkey or the rilava in hmm. Sinhala. And it is a species that has been traditionally a pest of agriculture. Mm. It's not something new. Mm. So it has traditionally been a pest of agriculture. And this fact is proven by the fact that the Fauna and Flora Protection Ordinance had never afforded it the protected status. Mm. So it had been an animal that could have been killed or harmed if it has traded the crops. Mm. Still, it's the legal position. It's not a protected species mm. of mammal. And it's one of the very few species of mammals that are not protected, despite the fact that it is an endemic species. Mm. But the other issue that is there is that people expect solutions from the government if they have a cultivation and if an animal raids the crops. And if that animal is not a protected species like the elephant, mm -hmm. then of course they are allowed to take the law into their hands and do whatever is necessary to defend the crop. Mm -hmm. But expecting the government to find solutions to each and every problem is I think another redundant concept held in the minds of so many of our population. Mm -hmm. The government has to seek solutions to problems, but not for every problem faced by every farmland and household. Mm. So they have to find their own solutions. Mm. And the government also has to look at it in a holistic manner. Mm. So that is the third part. And if there is an overpopulation of the talk monkey, that has to be proven by some scientific study. Mm. Because we have what we know as a concept, what is called the population density of a particular species. Hmm. So we had to see district wise what is the population density of this species. Hmm. And then we had to look the talk monkey not as a single entity, but as a species with different subspecies and see whether all subspecies are problematic or if not, what are the problematic subspecies and if they are problematic in which districts are they a problem and for what crops. And if we are to remove them, export or whatever it is, they are removed from their habitats. If we are to remove a population from their habitats or a certain number of individuals from the habitat, whether the population can afford to lose that number of individuals in quick succession. And if the population can rebound after that amount being removed and will the problem continue even after that. Hmm. Because sometimes when older individuals are removed, we all know that there will be an influx of new individuals coming with new breeding. For instance, all these monkeys have a hierarchy. They live in flocks. Mm. Each flock has a dominant male. Mm. And if we remove all the dominant males, then there will be fresh blood to breed once again. Mm. So these are the issues that we have to think about when we decide on the number of animals to be removed. Mm. Export is not the issue to a biologist, it is the removal of individuals or part of population from selected areas. Hmm. So we have to have a clear idea about the population dynamics uh, in the subspecific level and also about the problem that are faced in the different districts before deciding. So, hmm. so my position is that rather than opposing it or rather than being for it, mm -hmm. we have to first know the answers to these things, whether a proper scientific evaluation had been done, and if not, do it and justify this number if possible. So that is our position in this matter, but there are certain people who are vehemently for it, and there are certain organizations who are opposing it. Uh, I respect their different points of view, but the issue is we need facts, we need scientific evidence, we need a good analysis, we need something to see whether this removal of animals is going to help the country or help the farmers or whether it is another creation of another new problem. So that's why we were questioning the motive, we were questioning the science and the, the numbers behind this move.
-hmm. And yet we have to get some answers. Probably uh, we will get some answers in the new year, I hope. Uh, but Dr. Jagat Gunavardhana, now uh, in your response to that question, you said you view this in three ways and, and one of your viewpoints was the fact that the government does not have to get involved in solving each and every issue faced by each and every farmer or each and every household. Uh, now, is it your stance that uh, the issue of the talk monkey or you know, these real of us who are uh, damaging the crops of farmers, that is not an issue that should be solved by the government or the government should give less priority to that issue and focus more on solving the wild elephant issue? W what's your stance there? Now, the people have been allowed to hunt the animal if necessary. Hmm. Hmm. So the people also have a p role to play in defending their crops. Hmm. Hmm. But in the case of wild animals, it's a globally endangered animal. Hmm. And the uh, globally endangered animal has to be given more protection. Hmm. It does not mean that... So the, the talk monkey is a globally endangered animal? It is also globally endangered in a different context, but when it comes to the country, it's not an endangered species according to the national red list. But hmm. according to the global red list, it, because uh, it's an endemic species with a limited distribution, it falls into that category. Hmm. But what I'm trying to emphasize is that it is not to say that you can get away by massacring the populations of monkeys, hmm. but protect the elephants. But what I'm saying is, uh, when it comes to a species where the government has allowed a certain amount of freedom for the people to express their right to defend their crops, the hmm. people should at least go that far. Hmm. But if that is going to be a big issue, of course the government has to face the issue, because the issue of monkeys really is a man-made issue. We have gone to their habitats. So we have not been able to solve the unwanted destruction of habitats being converted into farmlands. So hmm. that is the crux of the problem. And many animals died because of their habitats being destroyed. But several species adapted themselves to farmlands and now they have become problematic. And certain other animals which have got displaced are only eking out their existence in uh, croplands. And hmm. that's again a problem to the crops. So we have to look in the wider context, but at the same time, the individuals also have a certain amount of responsibility to duly protect their crops. But I will take another example. If there is a coconut we will issue, or if there is another pest like insect pest, they don't look for the government to solve it. They take the initiative into their own hands. Mm. So likewise, there should be a way of combating this animals that are causing problems, both at the local level and at the state level. And population control is not achieved by killing them. Hmm. Population control can be achieved by so many different manners, which has to be considered carefully and weighed out carefully and go for options that are viable for the country. But first, before we can do any of this, there needs to be a proper study. And yes. as far as new knowledge goes, you are unaware of any proper scientific study or scientific report that has been prepared with regard to this matter? No, not to my knowledge, because last year the ministry appointed a committee mm -hmm. and I was also a member of this committee to look into this problem of animals becoming pest animals mm -hmm. or crop destroyers. And there was a report prepared by the Hector Cobbad Kadua Agrarian Research mm -hmm. and Development Institute or HARTI. And we asked for the report repeatedly. Mm. I personally asked for the report repeatedly. And the report was never produced to us, but only a summary of the so-called report was given to us, which is one page, and we just not have a methodology even to see whether there is a proper science evaluation of the species. And then the committee became uh, redundant because the report was not there for us to evaluate. Mm. So the baseline report has not been made available to us still and I am not aware of any other report also to justify this claim of 100,000 monkeys can be extracted at one time from Sri Lanka. If so, I would have to ask from which, which population, from which area and how many from each area is going to comprise this 100,000. So is this is this report a secret report? Like you know, under you the ATA, there were secret yeah. reports. It's proposed at least. Is it a secret report like that? I don't think it can be made secret because a secret report can be something that will deal with national security or such issues, but not on wildlife. Maybe unbeknownst to us, the population has grown so much out of control that it maybe even affect national security. Wouldn't that be a possibility, doctor? Yes. 
Well, of course, um, there is much more that uh, needs to be spoken of uh, as far as Sri Lanka's environment and Sri Lanka's wildlife goes. Uh, there was a very, very big hype uh, a few months ago, or maybe even a few, uh, maybe a year or so ago, about the Animal Welfare Bill. How much do you know of what progress has been made on that front? Uh, there was a draft. Uh, that was uh, mooted about, but what really has happened to that? Has it passed? Is it law in Sri Lanka? And if so, what is this law? So we'll bring you the details after this short commercial break. Don't go anywhere. You're watching Newsline Live. News First, Newsline. Turunu Sit. நிராமிச சுவையின் புரவன இருதின சதகம் பனுர கம்மேத்த தம் சவிய நியுஸ் பாஸ்ட் நியுஸ் லாய்ட் Welcome back. You're watching Newsline Live. We're in discussion with attorney at law, Dr. Jagath Gunawardhana. He's an environmental activist. Uh, but doctor, we spoke about several matters uh, before the commercial break. Uh, and we promised, of course, our viewers to give them an update about the animal welfare bill uh, that was uh, promoted by many uh, animal lovers in Sri Lanka and also the general public alike. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, it will protect uh, the lives of animals uh, that are living in Sri Lanka, including pets. Uh, cats, dogs and other forms of animals. There was a lot of animal cruelty and a lot of uh, reports about animal cru cruelty uh, that really touched the hearts of many people. And uh, the subject of protecting animals in Sri Lanka or the welfare of animals has been spoken of for many, many years. Uh, and uh, this came to a really decisive point where uh, the government was uh, taking note of these concerns and they proposed an animal welfare bill. Doctor, what happened to this? The bill was in the draft form, mm -hmm. but it was never uh, put in the order paper for the second reading. Was it, was it published on a gazette? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. But then it stopped. Mm -hmm. The process is still halfway through and we have yet to pass this bill and make it into a law. I'm, uh, unfortunately, we thought that it would have happened by this time, mm -hmm. but we have no option but to see that at least this will be passed within this new year. Mm -hmm. But uh, Dr. Jagat Gunavardhana, this uh, would have been put at least uh, or published on the Gazette uh, at least maybe six months to a year ago maybe? Um, yes. If, if my memory serves me right. But why the delay? I mean, is this um, such a uh, mammoth task to draft an animal welfare bill? Because it's not like we're reinventing the wheel. We're of course drawing in from provisions from various other Commonwealth nations, um, uh, and, and jurisdictions that have similar legal systems to Sri Lanka. Uh, is this, is drafting the animal welfare bill uh, that hard? No, the bill has been already drafted hmm. and it has been published in the Gazette that is, it is in the draft form. Hmm. So there is nothing more to draft in it. Hmm. Of course, that bill has certain shortcomings which we can deal with after that. Uh, if there is a problem, we can always deal with it in a subsequent amendment. But what I see is that there is a bill now, and the thing is to have this bill made into law as soon as possible, because hmm. this process had been dragging on since 2005, to my knowledge. Hmm. The first bill came in 2005, then it was uh, amended a little bit and brought once again in 2006, and then it once again came up in 2000. 15 mm -hmm. and latest into 2022 mm. and at least we have to pass it within this year because it is a bill that needs to be brought into the law as soon as possible because what we have in the present cruelty to animals act is a series of negative rights which are far outdated. We have to have a modern law where we have positive rights like welfare rights for animals and which will also show the world that how civilized we are in treating animals and how our laws are effective in having humane treatment meted out to animals. So we need this law uh, as soon as possible. That's my position since 2005 when the first bill was brought in. Every act, every bill may have certain shortcomings, but 
if we wait for the perfect bill or the perfect draft, it will never come. So what we have to do is, as we have seen in our long years of experience, we can pass the bill into law and bring in amendments if and when they are necessary. That is how I look at it. So, but Dr. Gudavarthana, now, if the bill has already been published via a gazette, and you said it's been happening since 2005, uh, there would have been many drafts that were tried and tested. Uh, the bill has finally been published uh, in, in the gazette as well. What's the hold up? Who is holding this bill back? That's the enigmatic question that is in my mind. There is no reason why it should be held up. There is no logical reason why it should be delayed. Mm. Unless no one is really bothered about it or no one is really interested about it, there is no reason why it should be delayed any further. Mm. So, Dr. Jagat Gunavartana, when you say no one is interested in it, are you pointing your finger at maybe, you know, animal rights organizations that um, they've lost interest in passing this animal welfare bill? Well, I can't put anything for the organizations because they are doing a good job as volunteers. Mm. I have my greatest praise for all these organizations, though they have rather different points of view about certain provisions in the draft bill. Mm. Whatever is said and done, these organizations have been pushing it consistently for a lot of years and mm. we only have praise and respect for what they had been doing and what they had been done in the past. Mm. But my finger is pointed at the ministry which is responsible for this. I think this bill has to come through the Ministry of Law and Order mm. because ultimately it's the police who is going to act on this bill. Mm. But it is not coming under that ministry. But again, I don't mind it being passed in the present way under this Ministry of Livestock and uh, Animal Husbandry, if I remember correct. Mm. The names of the ministries are not that familiar to me because, because they, they keep changed, on changing, changing every yes. five, six months, maybe. So anyway, that ministry has to get this bill into the order paper and get it passed to the parliament because it is much better to have a better law, a positive law rather than stuck with the century old negative law because the present law is something that was passed in 1907 mm. and it has only negative rights. That is, if the rights have been violated, we can take action, but we can't get someone to have these rights on animals hmm. or to have certain welfare measures on the animals. But we can only take action if they had treated the animal in such a manner that it amounts to cruelty. Hmm. Uh, so, Dr. Gunavartana, do you at least believe that there is consensus with regard to the draft bill that has been published in this gazette among public representatives, members of the cabinet, members of parliament is at least... I am not very much aware on this because last year we were kept busy by environmental issues and mm. this is something that I again support uh, for the public good and mm. also for the, as a help to the animal welfare organization. So it's hmm. not within my mainstream work. Hmm. So I'm sorry I'm not in a position to answer that question. Uh, well, Dr. Gunavartana, let's move uh, to a subject that is more your cup of tea, if I may say. The Express Pearl disaster, uh, one of the worst disasters, chemical disasters in the uh, <coughs> shores of Sri Lanka. Um, it, it devastated Sri Lanka's ocean. Um, I don't think the impact has, anyone can put really a price tag on the impact that it has had uh, on the nature in general, on the amount of turtles, dolphins that were killed by this disaster, uh, on the impact that it had on the lives of fishermen, uh, on the impact that it had on the fishing industry in Sri Lanka. All of these uh, can bring you to a conclusion that the damage that this incident caused to Sri Lanka to the environment, to the sea of Sri Lanka, to the world, in fact, is unfathomable. But today, we are in a state where we haven't still filed action against this matter. Uh, and environmental organizations raise the concern that if we do not file action by the month of May, Sri Lanka will not be entitled to any form of compensation because any action will be prescribed. 
What's your take on this, doctor? Yes, uh, there is a criminal action and mm. there is a civil action. Mm. The criminal action, to my knowledge, has already been filed and it's mm. pending before the courts. Mm. But the civil action needs to be filed, as you very correctly said, before the lapse of two years since the incident has occurred. Mm. So since the incident occurred in May 2021, mm. we have yet another month to file action mm. and we have to file action for compensation. Mm. And still there is a divided opinion whether this action has to be filed in Sri Lanka or this action has to be filed in Singapore because the company is based in Singapore. Hmm. But my position is that since this incident happened in Sri Lankan waters and it is within our jurisdiction that this happened, we have to file the action within Sri Lanka. And the other thing is we have filed criminal action in Sri Lanka. So why take the civil action out of our country? Hmm. And if we file action within our country, then it is heard according to the Marine Pollution Prevention Act. Mm. And the civil action may take some time, but at least we know for sure that it is our law that is being implemented. My position is that it should be filed in Sri Lanka and it should be filed preferably within this month or the worst possibility before the two year time expires. Otherwise we will lose everything as you very correctly said. Uh, so, but Dr. Gunavardhana, now, when this incident initially occurred, uh, there were politicians who came out and said, we will get enough compensation. There were even politicians who claimed that uh, the compensation uh, that would come out of this incident would help alleviate Sri Lanka's economic status because such would be the magnitude of the compensation that Sri Lanka would receive after a disaster like this. Quite a silly point to moot, but still, that's what they said. Uh, and many of these politicians who made these statements are still members of the government. So, my question to you is, what's the holdup? That's, I think, the question that has been perpetually in my mind also. We have to make sure that we have a good computation of the possible damages and the things that may happen in the future. Mm. We cannot say that the damage is something that can be ascribed to the past and that it mm. has mm. now stopped because the damage may go on for so many years hmm. and since this is the largest chemical disaster or the chemical ship disaster we have to look at a possibility of the damages being uh, circumvented by various means and the cost that we may have to enc encounter for these things hmm. the loss of livelihood included and the other thing is uh, the computation has to be done and it should be part of the case and it should be the experts who have done the computation who has to be the experts and the expert witnesses if the matter goes for hearing. Hmm. So I think most of these things had been already done. So my question is why delay filing the action till the 11th hour? Because there is always a possibility of something going wrong in the last hour. We had been taught as lawyers to file action as soon as possible when you gather the facts. Hmm. So I don't know the real position, I'm not in a position to answer that question, but I always feel very uneasy when action is getting delayed and the date is looming closer by every day. Mm -mm. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jagat Gunavardhana, for clarifying these matters, of course, uh, following the dawn of the new year. Uh, Sri Lanka is, of course, looking towards economic development. Uh, we are looking towards economic stability, prosperity, debt sustainability. But one thing that we mustn't forget is that all of this should be done in a sustainable manner. And I believe that is where uh, we as a nation went wrong even in the past. Uh, we did not consider the element of sustainability in all of our actions. It was pure development, disregarding sustainability. Uh, it was uh, economic uh, growth, disregarding sustainability. And protecting the environment in Sri Lanka, of course, is a very, very important aspect in ensuring sustainability in the times to come. Thank you very much, Dr. Jagat Gunavardhana, uh, attorney at law, environmental activist, for joining us on our show and clarifying these matters to the general public. Thank you very much to all our viewers for tuning in uh, once again to Newsline. Until we meet again, take care. And God bless. Yayu pa karubala gas webu gami chanatave. Paani ye chaliya swa evidagil kaliya.